Uh, welcome everyone to Punch Kick Joke Chat. My name is Robert Chlumsky. I'm here with Sensei Nicholas Suino, and we're here today on a micro episode. Again, a bit of a different format, just the two of us chatting, but we're here on a micro topic to talk about uh, balancing martial arts and professional life. And this topic was of particular inter interest to me. Um, so thanks, Sensei Suino, for coming to talk about it. Um, it's of interest to me because I'm fancying myself as someone who can kind of wade in both waters, have, obviously having some sort of established martial arts credentials over here and also working on, uh, you know, PhD and engineering license and, and some other things in the professional life over here and, and definitely valuing having both of those and, and having them hopefully synergize over the next, you know, 30 years that I'm working, living, breathing, doing all this stuff, hopefully beyond that too. Um, and I'm really grateful to Sensei Suino for uh, having a chat, um, answer a few questions and, and hopefully share some wisdom that will at least be beneficial for me, but I think for other people as well. I'll do what I can. I don't know if I got wisdom, but I got experience. And so <laughs> hopefully that'll serve. <laughs> um, so Sensei, we, we, we of course have your, uh, your full uh, 90 minute episode as our very first punch kick choke chat inaugural episode. So we don't need to dive into every detail of that, but um, maybe just give us a brief timeline of, you know, uh, your time in Japan and, and, and what you did and in, in the years up to that until uh, JMAC opened up. Yeah, 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 man. Um, as you know, I've been involved in martial arts since I was a kid, since eight years old, and always had the dream to go study in the homeland. So after grad school, uh, when I was 28, I moved to Tokyo. Well, I lived in Yokohama, but worked in Tokyo and spent four years there training in a, a variety of martial arts. Um, did pretty well in Iaido tournaments and made a lot of black belt ranks and got hurt and fought my ass off in the judo dojos and met a bunch of really famous people and it was just it was it was an amazing experience um but uh i decided to come back to the states came back in 1992 and um eventually decided to go to law school went to law school clerked in the michigan court system uh the the apex of my clerking career was i clerked for a michigan supreme court justice which was a really cool job but it was really demanding and it was tough to manage martial arts while i was doing that um but eventually practiced law for quite some time and uh for about 10 years and discovered that although i i think i was okay at it i didn't love it it didn't mm -hmm. make me happy about getting up in the morning and i really didn't like i like the intellectual part of the law but i never liked the negativity that was involved in it so in uh 2006, I moved back to my hometown here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and well, I'm skipping something. I while I was up in Lansing practicing law, I opened a dojo called the Itama Dojo, and um, that went well for ten years. Uh, I barely ever made a dime at it, um, so that was I figured out something else I didn't like, which was being broke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I took two and a half years off of of dojos, came back to Ann Arbor, opened a dojo, and and I had learned a lot. Right running a dojo for 10 years, it didn't make money. It was like getting a master's degree in, in uh, entrepreneurship. And so I resolved to take those lessons and not lose money. In fact, earn money, try to make it a, both a, a great martial arts dojo and a successful business. Um, and I started that in 2006 and I've done it. We've got 200 students and dojo makes a little money and that gives us a lot of opportunity to travel and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But also in 2006, I started a marketing business, Michigan SEO Group. Um, among other things. And these days I have a small publishing company. I write books. Um, uh, I rarely practice law anymore. Occasionally some somebody comes and convinces me to work on something a little bit, but I try not to do it just because you lose your chops, right? It's like not practicing martial arts for 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 three years and then ask someone asking you to get into a tournament. Um, you'd have to train your ass off. And I got other things, other fish to fry. Yeah. Um, and as you know, I'm pretty active now in the in the travel martial arts circuit, right? I go to karate tournaments and help out and teach Eido and things like that. So I got a rich full life, super busy, having way too much fun. Uh, uh, I owe a, a great debt of gratitude to your karate teacher, Randy Dofan Sensei, for uh, you know becoming a co-conspirator in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. He and I, he and I uh, uh, collaborate really, really well. And as they say, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. And he's been a he's been a driving force in this. So I probably would not be nearly as active in the in the international circuit as I am without his without his companionship. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let me take you back to uh, just before, let's say in the few years before JMAC opened in 2006, mm. um, when you were clerking and, and working the professional life. What, I mean, obviously the love for martial arts is part of what brought you back, but maybe talk a bit about that and, and maybe specifically your thoughts around, um, you know, just trying to answer to yourself, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to open the dojo? And, you know, as you said, not, uh, not be broke for uh, for some time into that. And what was your strategy around that, around those few years? Yeah, well, that's actually, for me personally, uh, uh, a really important part of my life story because, um, you know, I tried being very active in the law while I ran a dojo and the dojo suffered. So the last few years of my dojo in Lansing, I really wasn't giving it what I should have been, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I knew that, but, you know, I was trying to decide what to do. I eventually sold it to some of my students. Um, and when I moved to Northern Michigan to practice law up there, I um, I didn't have a dojo. I would go to a to a powerhouse gym and use the back room to practice Iaido and things in there. Um, so I didn't run a dojo for two and a half years. But we lived in a beautiful setting in Northern Michigan, and you know my wife and I would walk in the in the woods, and it was a real time of soul searching for me because not running a dojo and not practicing martial arts very much um, was a was a, a it did not make me happy. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And I knew it and I wasn't sure what to do with it, but I asked myself who I was and I told this story before. And the answer always came back. You're a martial artist first, get back to that. And so not being happy in the practice of law up there, uh, I decided to come back to Ann Arbor and a number of factors. So this it was the first time I thought when I started a business about the economics of the town I was moving to and not just the economics, but also the cultural interests you know, Ann Arbor is an affluent university town, a very diverse population. A lot of people are interested in things like culture and, you know, food and international issues. That actually weighed into my decision to open a dojo here, as well as the fact that I have, I had at the time, probably 30 martial arts friends in town, right? So instead of just going, I'm in a town, let me open a dojo, I actually was much more proactive about, okay, where am I going to go? Does it make economic sense? Do I have a base to start with? You know, and I opened JMAC with, I can't remember what it was, 20 or 30 students. Took me 18 months to get that many students at the first dojo I opened. Mm -hmm. So a lot of small things went into that learning process that made JMAC more successful on day one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, just on that note, it sounds like already a lot of thought kind of put into, hey, I'm not, you know, I'm not just going to go and open a dojo and run with it. I'm going to think about it, set it up, choose a location, have a bit of a game plan. Um, you know, I can certainly, I, I know a number of people in the last few years and number of years that have, um, you know, really wanted to start a dojo and just kind of jumped into it and then it didn't necessarily work out. So um, do you have any more advice for people like that? Where let's say their heart's in the right place. They're eager to open a dojo and get some students going. What What are the main things they need to think about beyond, you know, is there a market and the location? Well, first of all, yeah, right. The streets are littered with people that are good at martial arts and are lousy at business. <laughs> um, and I was too. That's why I had, right. That's why I had 10 year, uh, 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 reality based, uh, master's degree in that stuff. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is don't do what I did the first time, or probably not even the second time. If you're in a place and you don't have a martial arts school, do not, do not, do not obligate yourself to a lease. Instead, find a club, right? Rent some space in a, in an Aikido club or a, or a gym, um, or a YMCA, and build your, you know, it would be a lot easier, like I did in Ann Arbor, opening a dojo with 30 people, that covered the the rent, right? Otherwise, you're coming out of pocket. And no matter how driven you are, how passionate you are, yeah. there's something about that that just doesn't, it's not good, right? It's not how you should do it. So instead, you find the cheapest possible alternative and be a great charismatic, you know, martial arts teacher, build your audience, you get to that level. Now, all of a sudden, it's going to make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lessons that ring in there from the uh, the entrepreneurship world and the startup world about, you know, basically uh, de-risk your uh, your startup and, you know, basically, uh, yeah, risk risk proof what you can, test what you can, build it up a little with sort of little cost before you kind of have at least in some sense it's going to succeed and then take it take the next step after that. Don't necessarily jump in for all this money and then realize crap this isn't going to the work as expected. Yeah. And one of the things about our modern world is we have great opportunity. You know, you can open up a, a website, you know, for essentially free and, and start marketing it for free. But 
the old model of the apprenticeship program covered a lot of that stuff. You know, you work for somebody for five years, you get good at the craft, but you also see them interacting with customers, right? You learn all the inside and outside stuff. And maybe if, if you're working for somebody who's aging out, they start handing you the keys, right? That's, That's a right. much more organic path and the risk is lower, but the patience level is a lot higher, mm. right? It's much more like a model of traditional martial arts training uh, than it is like just jump in and go. So um, if you don't have that, then you have what you just described, right? That proactiveness, the, you know, the research, the thought, the study. Um, it's just, it should surprise no one, right? That if you do more research and more more preparation, you you have a greater likelihood of success. That's right. Um, let, let me ask you if you don't mind about uh, Michigan SEO and and how that came came to be and where that fit in relation to JMAC, which came first and what the thought process was to uh, to, to start that and, and be able to actually run run both. Well, I had no uh, thoughts of being in the marketing business ever in my life. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I learned from the first the first dojo back in the old days of phone books, if anybody remembers what those were, um, <laughs> our marketing was phone books and flyers and an occasional demonstration. That was it. Um, you didn't have anything else. And so now I opened a new dojo in 2006. We have this thing called the internet, right? And Google. And I had a buddy in the website business. And the only reason I went to him was, hey, create a website for me. And then we had this conversation about like, oh, well, this is going to cause the students to come flooding in, right? And he's like, no, there's this other thing out there. It's called SEO. you got to build it up. You've got to do the stuff. you got to get links to other sites. you got to have good content on your site. you got to do things on social media. Um, so since I had a few students, but not, not many, uh, and no other job at the time, I spent, you know, 40 hours a week doing that work and learning the trade, the website and SEO trade, and built up JMAC to the point where we had a really good web presence, which has driven traffic since then to, to this day. Um, so it hundred percent came out of the JMAC experience, right? I did it to market JMAC. Um, and the reason I fell into marketing was because I would go to business networking events and hear all these people, you know, thinking I was going to say, go study judo with me and yeah. realizing that the, the audience wasn't there with me. What they really wanted was to grow their own businesses. And I had just figured out a way to really do that for myself. Uh, so, you know, started with coffee and conversation. It's went to some free help. And then, you know, uh, this literally grew so organically. I remember, re you know, somebody begged me to do this for them professionally one time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was just like, oh, my God, I don't know. Would you pay me 250 bucks a month? <laughs> and, you know, we were terrified to ask for that. Well, that was that was in, I don't know, 2007 or something like that. Um, we've come a long way. I mean, business has generated million dollars, millions of dollars over the years. Um, obviously, not all that came to me, but, you know, as a as a business. That's um, right. Um, we've come a long way from those days, but the point is it was earned on the mean streets. And like most things in my life, it arose out of the, the core, which is the martial arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's funny how many of those things kind of arrive out of serendipity or or need in the moment. And then that blossoms into something totally different. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you, Sensei, with, uh, um, you know, I, I imagine, especially in the early days of both Michigan SEO and JMAC, there must have been weeks when something was on fire with Michigan SEO and you have to put out something over here or work overtime over here. And then on the flip side, you know, head of promotions in the early days or something happened at JMAC or, you know, whatever. Some I'm sure you had a million issues that came up. How, how do you balance the two and, and how do you decide, okay, this week I'm going to put, you know, half my time here, half my time here, or, you know, I need to put hundred percent over here because this is happening. How, how did you balance that in the beginning? Well, you've got to do it. I mean, if you're committed to running a business, right, whether it's a dojo or a marketing business or an engineering firm, you've got to do it. You're all in, right? You got to be mm -hmm. all in. There's no other way. There's. Um, I have a good friend who runs an auto import business that he took over from someone and they've gone through a lot of troubles, but he's very successful now. And, and, and he says, you know, people always are looking for the easy business. There's no easy business. Mm -hmm. If you want an easy business, get out, go work for somebody, right? There's no right. easy business. It's all consuming, which is what I love about it now, although there's days and late nights when I hate it. Um, <laughs> but but yes, when something's on fire or you've got to make a really hard decision or you got to do a ton of work, you got to do as much as possible. Um in the in the in the I own more than one business or I'm passionately in pursuit of more than one thing, life balance is bullshit. That idea of having work-life balance, fuck it. That's the stupidest idea ever. If that's you, again, go work for somebody. And no, right? No, no criticism. It's just mm -hmm. you got to know who you are. 
Um, but if it's not you, if you're driven, then you got to say, fuck it, I've got to do what it takes and I'm going to miss out on some stuff. And that's just how it is. Um, what's really interesting about this, you know, the hard work, yes. Um, but what's really interesting about this is, you know, our last micro episode that you and I had, we were talking about seasonality in the martial arts and how you may put more effort into one than the other. Uh -huh. um, not only was that the case, balancing SEO work and, and running a dojo, the other thing that was the case where there were times when one saved my ass financially, mm -hmm. right? You know, I was at least able to draw a small check from JMAC right while we were getting Michigan SEO group started. And then, um, you know, we have a crisis in the business, you know, when, uh, when COVID hit, um, JMAC that, you know, JMAC ran a deficit for a long time during COVID. Happily, I was able to draw a paycheck from Michigan SEO group. So that's another advantage of it, right? At least it keeps you out of the, the poor house. Um, yeah. And I, I imagine Michigan SEO was, uh, maybe the opposite in that time. Oddly enough, Michigan SEO was very steady through COVID. You mm -hmm. would expect, I, we were terrified. We lost a client or something during COVID. We thought, we thought we would drop half, you know, I was at 35% of my pre COVID membership at JMAC, um, during peak COVID. Um, but we never got any, like anything like that hit in MSG, but it happened, it happened later. Like happily, for whatever reason, these two things are not in sync and mm -hmm. knock on wood, I say that out loud and you know, the next crisis will kill them both. But, um, but uh, uh, they've saved me financially. And then, you know, if I'm having a really bad week at one, I may rarely have a really bad week at JMAC, but if I'm having a bad week at one, then I'm at least having a steady week at the other, right? It gives you some perspective, mm -hmm. which is nice. Yeah. Your, uh, your comment on the work-life balance being bullshit made me think of the uh, the expression, you can you can have it all, but not all at once, right? You have to, mm -hmm. you, you do have to put your time in, and your eggs in one basket, at least for some time to move that forward. And then, you know, you, you, you can't just uh, have that balance all the time and expect everything to, you know, come out in that whatever one to 5% likelihood of, of success that you're, that you're chasing. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. How else do they say that? They say you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and again, for most people, I do not recommend this, right? I recommend they pursue one business and one hobby, right? Or, or uh, one job and one hobby. Like if you're really passionate about martial arts and you want to train 20 hours a week, get a job that allows you to work hard and punch out at 5 p.m. and go train. Like that's so much easier, or at least uh, probably not from their perspective, but from my perspective. Um, yeah. um, I don't recommend what I do. It's crazy, but it's it's how I'm wired. So here we yeah. go, right? Yeah. Um, one, one other question I've had, um, that I want, been wanting to, to ask you is, uh, um, you know, there, I guess there's this idea that if you're a professional martial artist and you, all you do is run a dojo, um, that at least for some students, they might have the idea that, oh, like their income is entirely based on my, my attendance and how much I pay for seminars and gradings. Whereas if you're also professional, you might not, um, you know, you might not care how much uh, it is over here because, you know, you're going to have money in your professional life too. So do you think that plays into students' mentalities at all about even just the, you know, student sensei relationship or anything like that? You know, rarely, rarely does it. The truth is, I think people that are focused on that are focused on the wrong things and they're probably not going to be good long-term students anyway. Um, can you imagine that, that you are training with somebody you respect enough to devote a lot of your time and money to be with and you want them to be poor, like that's a stupid idea, right? And so if yeah. you have that idea and you harbor it for a long time, you're probably not, you know, you're not JMAC material. I've got okay. people, I'm glad you asked this question because, right, it's something I've thought about and dealt with a lot, uh, not a lot, but occasionally over the years. Um, I've got people that make ungodly amounts of money, um, you know, that train with me that, um, that, quibble about you know oh my god the dues are going up really you know and they just i know they i know they spend more than that taking their family to sushi on wednesday night like i know that right but they're paying for the family to come train with me you know like three days a week all month long and then i've got people that are that are waiting tables or working in a coffee shop and happily month after month year after year they come in and they pay those same dues right with never a complaint mm -hmm. If they can't like step through that doorway into the dojo and live into the martial arts experience, then they're probably not going to stay anyway. And honestly, I don't care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's right. interesting. You say that. Yep. I mean, I'm self-conscious about it. I don't want people to think I'm getting rich off of them. Um, but at the same time, I see the other side of it, which is, 
it's kind of none of their business. If I'm teaching them great martial artists and they got the money and it's worth it, go, right? Yeah. Everybody else, go somewhere else. I don't care. Does it do anything for you personally, let's say, to maybe take pressure off yourself about being self-conscious about it? Or does it not really make much of a difference that the fact that you have another business that isn't strictly martial arts related? Um, I don't know. I suppose, I, I don't know if everybody's like this. I think everybody who's thoughtful is like this. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think you should always be self-conscious about, you know, how much you live into the status of being a high level martial artist or a rich person or like, um, I am a big fan of capitalism. I think it creates a lot of opportunity and goodness in the world. Um, but I'm not a fan of greed and, um, not a fan of taking advantage of other people. So I'm definitely self-conscious about trying to be really fair. Um, it, 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 I pull a lot of hairs out before I, before I raise dues, you know, yeah. um, cause I've been there too. And in fact, I do a lot of work with, with scholarships and helping students find jobs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think it's a fair balance between, between confidence in my, my capitalist, uh, tendencies and my self-consciousness about trying to take advantage of others. I think I do a fair job of it, but I, I, I definitely, I definitely have a, a moral compass, if you will. It might not be the same moral compass as other people, but I do care. So yeah, I, tough to say. That's a, I don't have a final answer on that, but I think as soon as you stop, as soon as you stop caring, then, then you're probably in dangerous territory, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, it's probably, you know, just like it's good to always be a little bit nervous for something you're doing just to show that you care. It's probably good to always be a little bit self-conscious just to check yourself and make sure you're not, you know, um, focusing on the wrong things, let's say. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, so you're now in a world where you've been working on your PhD, you're, you're, you're all but done. You're, you're starting to build your career. You train in BJJ, you train in karate, which you've done for many, many years. You've got a young family you have got to have been facing some of these balance issues. What's that been like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's definitely been difficult, certainly at different times, um, you know, feeding back to our other micro topic on seasonality, there's definitely been a lot of thinking about, um, and as we just said, you can't have everything all at once, but you can work on different things at different times. It's especially this year when I'm, when I'm trying to really get the PhD out the door, um, just giving myself permission to uh, really just focus on one thing and not, 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 take too many guilt trips and beat myself up when, you know, I can't make it to the tournament or I can't, you know, be there to support students at a grading and, and just realizing that there are legitimate, um, I guess, barriers for me to be able to do some of those things and, and that it's okay to uh, focus on one aspect right now and, and a little bit less on some of the others. Um, I think that's been at least my biggest lesson this year. And, and certainly as things change and PhD is done and business starts to take off and, and, you know, there'll be more involvement in the dojo too, both, on the mats and otherwise, I, I I do imagine there'll be some shift and rethinking of what the schedule looks like and how time is allocated and and all those kinds of things are kind of will be up in the air in the next couple of years. So this is a definitely a timely conversation for me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been a big lesson in just you know uh, how to manage things, how to keep some semblance of a work life balance, or at least how to make a specific decision about how to shift that balance and the and, and what time period is allocated to that. Um, and yeah, just figuring out how to how to live life and uh still be a person that doesn't uh get too ridden by the the guilt of not being in the dojo or missing a deadline to submit a paper or whatever the case is that week yeah yeah and and a big source of that is kids too right you have a beautiful family wonderful kids and of course you want to spend time with them and they want to spend time with you yeah uh, that's a tough that's a tough balance I've, I've made some decisions where i wasn't around as much as i i could have been i'm happy my kid has turned out to be a really wonderful human being um, but it didn't have to be yeah. that way, right? I could have, I could have been screwing things up. I, uh, it seems like it worked. It's worked out though. Yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, uh, I've, I've talked to Sensei Dofen a lot about this kind of thing, as you can imagine. And he, he has a story that he's, he's told in the dojo, you know, well, well before I had kids about um, uh, his oldest daughter Cindy when he, you know, she was maybe whatever four or something like that, clinging on his leg, saying, "Daddy, Daddy, don't go to the dojo tonight." And he said, "Cindy, I love you. Just have to, you know." You're staying here tonight and I have to go to the dojo. And so there's, uh, I've had a lot of thoughts about things like that and, and just really try to, you know, uh, it's may maybe less important the last two years, but especially moving forward as kids get older and they'll remember more about what are the critical things to be at and what are the really important things about raising a family and, and having kids and making sure that those don't get left behind, but also realizing that, um, 
yeah, I mean, being a professional, being a martial artist, these things also have sacrifices that come with it. And, and you're not a, you know, bad person for, for prioritizing that. I think if anything, it makes you sort of an interesting person and a role model to be able to take all these things on and do them at different times in your life. And then have something to, you know, tell your kids about too, and, and other people and other students as well to say, here's how I overcame this. Here are the milestones I, I achieved and here are the sacrifices I had to make too. Kind of, you know, it makes you an interesting person and, and someone who can then support other people, including your own kids. But aside from that, but just other other students or other people and and how to achieve those things too. You're, you're not necessarily the the hero if you just 100% prioritize one thing and ignore everything else, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no uh, heroes without heroes journeys, right? And that's, there's yeah, some that's sacrifice right. there. You're becoming a deep well and that's that's part of our path as, as human beings. Yeah. Super cool, um, man. Since I feel like we could go on this for a long time, but we'll keep it to a micro length today. Um, but yeah, I, I I imagine that there may be more of these episodes, either recorded or not, that that we have some discussions about. But yeah, thanks so much for sharing some wisdom today. Um, maybe if I could ask you one last thing for, let's say, people like me that are looking to do some version of, of what you've done with professional life on one side, martial arts life on the other, or obviously with a lot of bridging between them. What's what's your parting advice or piece of wisdom for people in that boat? Uh, if you have a vision for doing it, you better do it. Uh, regret is way more expensive than failure. <laughs> um, so, so just I say, I say, do it because look, you throw yourself into something for a year, two years, three years. We live in a really incredible time right now where there's second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances. So, if you try something and quote unquote fail, as long as you take the lessons from it and move forward and find the thing that really drives you in the future, you're going to live a, a life that's incomparable. And I don't mean I don't mean financially. I mean, the, the psychic rewards, the rewards for being who you are in a great way, living a vibrant life. There's nothing like it. So uh, as Nike says, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Nike, if you want to be a sponsor, reach out to us. That's it. Um, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to all the people behind the scenes. Um, they keep the show going. And uh, yeah, we'll see you uh, sometime next week or sometime after that for, uh, for a live show. Thanks so Sounds much. Good. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Have a great day. You too.